I wonder if you've ever been to a grocery store, probably, and if you ever go and it's... Now, if you're like me, my trips tend not to be to get one item. I have to go and get about 70 or 80 items at the grocery store. So rather than taking a lazy man's load, which I have done before, I think I can do about 24 items. What do you think? Maybe 25 on a good day. Got to go to the gym. But the reality is, is that usually I use a shopping cart. So I want you to remember the last time you went to the grocery store to get a shopping cart. And you walked over and it seems fine. So you go, it's a little dirty, so you smudge it off. Maybe you pull out a Lysol wipe, clean it off. And now you take and you're ready to go shopping. Except what's the problem? You push it a little bit and suddenly you hear this. You got a wobbly wheel. Have you ever experienced this? A wobbly wheel on a grocery cart. It can be so frustrating. You know, we sometimes are focused on all the big things in life. But the wobbly wheel on the grocery cart, that's going to put me over the edge. I mean, come on. But however, so rather than going back and getting a different cart, what do I think I can do? I can overcome the problem of the wobbly wheel. So I start pushing my cart, and immediately I go to the parts of the store with the heavy items because I think, you know what? My wobbly wheel is going to go away if I just load the cart with some weight. So I go over, and I get produce, and I say, today's a great day for butternut squash. So I load it in there. And then I'm going to do extra starches. I get red potatoes and sweet potatoes. And I push it, and what happens? So I go over and I get chicken. And I don't just get a little chicken. I get chicken breast and chicken thighs. And I load them in my cart. And what happens? So then I say, that's it. I've got the secret. Hershey bars. So I go over and get the big pack of Hershey bars. I get three of them. I say, I'm a parent. My kids are going to eat them. Now, my kids are never going to see the Hershey bars, but that's not the point. And so I throw them into the carriage and I could keep going. When we come into times like Thanksgiving, like the Christmas season, like New Year's, we have a wobbly wheel problem of our own. When we do not have thankfulness as an element in our lives, as a core element, it is like having a wobbly wheel on a grocery cart. We try to do the same thing. Rather than having a fundamental mindset of, wow, I am thankful, Not I'm thankful for. Not I'm thankful for my electronics, my possessions, my house. Having a saying, I'm going to just have a thankful mindset in my life. When I don't have that, I have a wobbly wheel problem. And we do the same thing. Just like when we load the grocery cart with things thinking that it's going to fix the wobbly wheel. When I am not thankful, what do I try to do instead? I say, hey, I'm going to take busyness and I'm going to put that in my cart. So I'm going to put a couple activities. Then what else am I going to put in? Well, I'm not perfect, so I'm going to throw some resentments in my shopping cart. And that's going to fix my... I'm, the more weight, the better, right? And I keep doing this over and over. Maybe I put... What are some of the things I put? Maybe I put some debt in there. I say, you know what? If I just finance one more thing I can't necessarily afford, that's going to fix my life. And so I put it in my cart... And what do I still have? The wobbly wheel. Now, the thing is, Paul is writing to the Colossians, not about a shopping cart, but you're going to notice we've gone through the book of Colossians for many, many weeks. This is our second to last week going through Colossians. If you've got your Bible, we're going to be turning into the fourth chapter, and I invite you to do that now. We're going to be in verse two of the fourth chapter, and you're going to see if you have a Bible with headings, it's going to say an encouragement for prayer. Now, that's not part of the original text. What this is really about is Paul is reminding the church of Colossae, and let's, let's backtrack. Who is Paul? Paul was previously Saul of Tarsus, a hateful guy who had a lot of wobbly wheels in his life, and he tried to load the cart with things like cheering for the killing of Stephen and being really religious and all these things that he loaded into his cart and he wasn't happy. And then Jesus confronts him on the road to Damascus and over time, not only does Paul immediately confess that he's a sinner, that he needs grace, that he needs Jesus and he gets baptized, but then for 14 years, the Bible tells us, he studies and he learns until he's ready to do cool things for God. Then he does those things, 
And what's his reward? He ends up in jail. And so he's writing this letter from jail to a people he's never met, to a church he didn't plant, and to a place he'll never go. But he concludes really with this encouragement to have thankful lifestyle. We're going to see that this isn't just Thanksgiving. We think of Thanksgiving, right, like the holiday. It's not just Thanksgiving, but it's thanks praying and thanks living and thanks speaking, that it's a whole mindset. Paul is going to tell us in this scripture, he's going to say very clearly, if you've got something out of conformity in your life, if you've got a wobbly wheel, the solution is not, for the Colossians, it was not cultural conformity with earthquake gods. It was not legalism about doing all these things. It was not worshiping angels. It was having a thankful mindset in their entire life. And so that's what our big idea today is. It's Thanksgiving season. Thanksgiving, thankfulness makes all the difference. Let's say this together. Three, two, one. Thankfulness makes all the difference. So what you're going to see is the Apostle Paul gives us some strategies to do this because we're people, we're not perfect, and we need strategies. We surrender to God, and we say, Lord, would you lead me in my life? And God is faithful. God says yes. And then there are specific strategies we can use not to work out our salvation, not to be saved, but to say, wow, I've received salvation. Now I get to live differently. Now I get to let the gospel saturate every part of my life. And so I'm going to show you how that begins with not just thanksgiving, but thanks praying. Now you're going to see early on in here, encouragement for prayer. Here's what the Apostle Paul is going to say. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Remember, he's in prison. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. My friends, when we have a wobbly wheel in our lives, when we have something that just feels like it's out of conformity, we're saying, there's a problem and I'm not exactly sure how it got here or why it is. Paul is saying, let's start by devoting ourselves. And what are we going to devote ourselves to? We're going to devote ourselves to prayer. Now, if you just take a Greek word, the Greek word means steadfastly continue in prayer. I don't really find that helpful. If someone comes up to me and I'm having a bad day, and they say, David, I just need you to steadfastly continue in prayer. Here's what I will say to them. You're weird. You're religious. I don't know what that means. That's not helpful. Like, I was having a bad enough day, and now you're giving me religious guilt. So here's what it really means. Imagine glue. What Paul is saying is that we want to have glue. We're going to attach ourselves to prayer. Is that a little easier than, hey, Josh, I need you to steadfastly continue? We're going to attach ourselves to prayer. Okay, that's helpful. What are some of the things we attach ourselves to? Well, we attach ourselves to possessions, don't we? Everybody look at what you got. You probably have things in your pocket. You've attached yourself to them. You're probably, hopefully, wearing shoes. You've attached yourself to them. So those are things we attach ourselves to, and they're just part of, they become part of who we are. What are other things we attach ourselves to? Um, what about goals? Anybody got, if you're my age, you got a five-year plan, right? Five-year plan, the things I want five years from now. We attach ourselves to goals. We say, hey, life is where it is right now, but just wait. This is what I'm planning on doing. This is where God is bringing me. That's something we attach ourselves to. It's Thanksgiving. We'd be remiss if we didn't say this. One of the things we attach ourselves to is core memories, Anybody got core memories in your life? We often have them. One of the reasons we struggle in times of thanksgiving is because we have core memories and we want to recreate them. And then life is life like it was in the 70s, 80s, 90s. No, it's very different. So we attach ourselves to things and then they kind of let us down. Paul says, hey, don't attach yourself just to the core memories or the possessions. Attach yourself to prayer. If you've got a wobbly wheel... Attach yourself to prayer. Make it part of your life. 
But now you could say, that's fine, David. So a pastor who gets paid to be a Christian is sitting and telling me to pray more. Thanks for the church guilt. Don't nod your head or, or put your hand up. But anybody feel that way? So Paul's going to, here's, if you saw in the text, it's going to give you a really quick series of concrete, tangible ways to do this. Let's look at the first one. So the first thing we're going to say is we want to pray with an alert mind. We want to be focused. Anybody know what a beef eater is? So the guys that used to be Queen's guards, now they're King's guards. They've got a red suit and they've got a fuzzy black hat. You with me? Okay. Those guys are focused. How do I know that they're focused? It becomes international news when they crack a smile. There was a day it was like 105 degrees, and so one of them got a water break in England, and it was international news. When we pray, we want to pray with focus. Not all the distractions, not, oh, my life is so hard, and all the things I've put in my shopping cart, the busyness and the consumerism and the addictions and the resentment, but no, Hey, right now, whether it's for five minutes or five seconds, I'm praying, I'm going to be focused. I'm going to have a single mind. Then he also says, don't just pray with an alert mind, but also with a thankful heart. Okay, it's interesting. I will ask you to raise hands. Who writes a lot of thank you notes? Anybody part of a thank you note culture? Here's the cool thing about thank you notes. Have you ever gotten a text message that is like nine paragraphs long? Anybody ever get that? Too long didn't read is what we say in my generation. The nice thing about a thank you note is you have about 40 words maximum in there. So what you got to do is you got to say, dear blank, thank you for blank, it made a difference this way, sincerely or love, depending on your relationship, me. Okay? It's precise. When we pray, we don't need to pray for everything. To make prayer part of our identity We don't have to say, wow, I feel awful because I don't have time to pray for every issue in the world. No. If I've got a wobbly wheel, one of the ways I can have thankful living in my life is to pray precisely. For example, here's something precise I can pray about. We're coming up on Thanksgiving. People are going to be isolated. So I'll give you a sample. People say sometimes, I'd love to pray. I don't know how. Here's a prayer you can pray this week. Dear God, People are going to be isolated. Lord, I pray that you would send Christians into the lives of isolated people in our community. And Lord, if I have a way to be part of that, Lord, would you make it clear to me? Amen. See how it's precise? See how you don't have to have guilt about, I'm not sure what to do. So Paul says that. He also says one other thing. He says, and this is huge, pray for Christians. He asks the people that he didn't plant, that he's never met, who he's never visited, to pray for him. We want to be thinking when we've got that wobbly wheel, when we're not thankful, hey, my life is not a vacuum. My life is not me, myself, and I, even though it feels like it. Here's the thing. There's Christians where all over the world. I can be connected to them. The greatest technological advancement ever was not the internet, was not the movable parts in the factory, and it was not the car. Do you know what it was? The transatlantic cable. The transatlantic cable was set up in 1850, and it went from one side of the Atlantic to the other side of the Atlantic, and for the first time, I'm going to pick on someone. Anita, congratulations, you're a courier now. I love Anita, she's wonderful. So Anita, it used to be that if I wanted to send a message to London, I would write it out, hand it to Anita, she'd get on a boat, she'd take a boat ride for a while through storms to London. And then she'd hand the note, and then the person would give her another note, and Anita would take another boat ride back to the United States. With the transatlantic wire, that was no longer necessary. Suddenly there was connection. When we pray, let's pray with connection. Let's say there are Christians in every part of the world. There are Christians in every aspect of life in America. There's Christians in my family or not. There's Christians in my community or not. But wherever there are Christians... Can I be praying for them? Now, I want to put this all together. Some of you, many of you are aware that this past week was a hard week for the Cushing family because four-year-old Ruby Grace, she had a 105-degree fever, and she was hallucinating pink dust. And so she went to the hospital in the ER. Now, if you've ever been four years old, which all of us have, it can be a scary experience going to the hospital. Can we agree? 
So when she went there, it was about 11 at night, she was freaked out, and everything was upsetting. And we can relate to that. Life is scary. Life is upsetting. And when we're little, especially, we don't understand what's going on, and we don't feel good. And so for the first about half hour, it was really tense in the hospital. And she spilled her medicine all over the floor, maybe intentionally, maybe not. And she had a very difficult time until babies started crying. And you can say, what? Until babies started crying. Because Ruby has a rhythm of prayer in her life. Suddenly, she said, hey, Dad, there's crying babies. I said, there are. She said, we should pray for them. I said, we should. And now for the next five hours, not for five hours straight, but at various times when she heard a baby cried, she calmed down, she was focused, she precisely, a four-year-old can pray like a sentence, right? Dear God, there's a baby crying. Thank you for Jesus. Please help the baby feel better. Amen. And she was connected. And it made a huge difference in her life in that experience to the point where at the end of the time, at about four in the morning, she, the nurse was like, you stayed awake the whole time and you were really calm. Do you want to go have a special tour? And she got a special tour of the hospital. Now the point is, is that when we are praying, we want to have thanks praying in our lives. If the wheel is wobbling... One of the reasons it's wobbling is because we have the wrong relationship with prayer. It's not part of our identity. So I'm going to ask you two questions to reflect on. Number one, is prayer already part of your non-negotiable identity? If it is, awesome. If your wheel's still wobbling, I'll show you why. There's a couple other things. If it's not, okay, rather than having church guilt, rather than beating yourself up, say, okay, Maybe this week I'm just going to be focused in praying. Maybe I'm just going to be precise. Maybe I'm simply going to be connected. Take one of these strategies, not as a silver bullet, but to say, wow, I don't always know how to pray, but I know I want to pray. Notice I said, you don't need to pray. I want to pray. Therefore, I have an opportunity to do some thanks praying in my life. Now, Paul doesn't stop there. He also, because sometimes, even though it's hard to pray, it's easy to pray, isn't it? It's living that's hard. Can anyone agree? It's sometimes the hardest thing is living. So Paul talks about thanks living, and he's going to nail the problem. One of the issues that we have as Christians is we don't live in what's called a monastic community. A monastic community is where you're separate from everyone who's not a Christian, and you live your life, and you never have to deal with them. Now, it's good and bad that we're not in a monastic community, because truthfully, wouldn't that be peaceful? But Paul is going to say this. We're going to read this together. Three, two, one. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Blame Paul, not me. Sorry, that's the Apostle Paul. If you don't like that, we can talk to Paul in heaven someday. We can sit down and have a Starbucks with him. There will be Starbucks in heaven. And you can say, Paul, I didn't love that you wrote that to the Colossians. Or we can say, wow, I need to have some thanks living in my life. So, here's the deal. What he is saying is that time is an investable resource, is that our greatest resource as Christians is not our money. It's not everything else. It is our time. Where we put our time makes a huge difference. And where we get in trouble as Christians is we don't understand what Paul is trying to say here. There's certain people we grow with And there's certain people we invest with. And we don't get weird about it and guilt people and say, you're not a Christian, so I'm just going to have a certain relationship with you. No, you don't be weird. I want to show you this. Paul is saying, hey, we're going to grow with Christians and we're going to invest with non-believers. Let me make it real. If I'm struggling in my marriage and I need to talk to other people to speak life into my marriage... I want to grow with Christians. Look around in the room, or if you're on the screen, think of the Christians in your life. There are people here, if I'm having a challenge in my marriage, these are the first people to talk with, to grow with. However, when I'm in life, I don't want to, if I have a non-Christian coworker, I don't want to go, hey, you're not a Christian. Until you do the sinner's prayer and accept Jesus, I can't talk to you, because that's weird and not biblical. What I want to say is, wow, My time is a resource. When I'm with Christians, I will grow. 
When I'm with non-believers, I'll be buds with them, and I'll invest in them. And maybe there's some things that I can get out of that that's appropriate. If I've got a non-Christian who's really good with the stock market, and I have a question about stocks, totally appropriate question. If I have a non-Christian who's really good at fantasy football and my team has not won a game, perfectly appropriate to talk to them about. But the places where I need to grow in my life, that I want to do with Christians, with people who not only just share my values, sometimes we talk about that. It's not moralism. It's that if someone is walking with Jesus and I'm walking with Jesus, we can walk together and grow. If someone is somewhere else, I can continue walking with Jesus because remember the stories of Jesus. He always notices the non-believers. He always notices the people who are disenfranchised and struggle in their societies. And he's always kind with them and he's always compassionate. But he doesn't just say, hey, we're going to... I like to think of Christianity as a jersey. Jesus doesn't say, hey, hang your faith as a jersey in the closet and go be a normal person for a while and then pick up your jersey again and wear it. No, what we do is we have an authentic, every day, every way walk with Christ and we invest with those people knowing that just because I have a non-Christian friend, I don't have to grow with them, but I don't have to judge them either. I'm there to be kind and to see my time as an investment. Now, this became really real for me for the first time in middle school. Hey, in our worst moments, I joke about this, do we ever go back to a middle school mindset? Anybody ever have that? If our wheel is wobbling, the first time it wobbled was when? Probably in middle school, right? That was the first time. In eighth grade, a friend of mine, it was so long ago, I'll use his first name only. His name was Connor. He asked me, he failed his math test. He asked me to destroy his math test. He was not a believer. What did I say? Yes, of course, I will do it. So I destroyed his math test for him. And I didn't think anything of it. Math test was destroyed. We didn't have any sort of digital grading or Aspen or any sort of power school like you might have now. So I thought nothing of it until the next day. When Connor's mom was very angry because Connor's mom wondered where the math test was. And he said, my friend David destroyed it. <laughs> Thank you, Connor. Thank you for throwing me under the bus. Okay. I learned that day that I want to be very careful, not judgy, but very careful with my non-Christian friends. If I just join in the cultural fray and destroy math tests, think of that as a metaphor. If I just join in with other people and destroy their math tests for them, that's the wrong mindset. I can grow with Christians and invest in non-believers. So here's my questions for you. Number one, who are the Christians who help you grow? I'd love you to reflect on this this week. I'd love you to write it down. I'd love you to jot down three to five names. Who are the Christians who helped me grow? Then I, I'm going to make an ask. Then I want you to reach out to a couple of them. You don't have to set up coffee necessarily. Reach out to them. Grow with them. If, if those Christians help you grow, reach out to them this week. It's Thanksgiving. You can just say, Happy Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for you, my relationship with you. Then, do I see time with non-believers as an investment? Really powerful question. And am I being careful to make this distinction? To grow with Christians and to invest with non-believers. Okay, so Paul is, hopefully our wheel is a little better now. And so we've talked about praying, we've talked about living, but there's one more thing that gets us into trouble. What is it? Everybody point to your mouth. Speaking, right? Oh, yes. Hey, don't raise your hand, but how many people have, don't raise your hand, have destroyed a relationship simply by saying one dumb sentence, right? Okay, so you hear me. So we want to talk about thanks speaking, and the Apostle Paul is going to conclude this passage with talking about the importance of having speech that is gracious and attractive. Hmm, interesting. Okay, we'll read this together again. I love reading scripture as a church family. Let's read it. I won't even count. Here we go. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. We're going to read it again because that's so great. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. In fact, I like it so much, we're going to read it one more time without me. Ready? Let conversation... Be 
What does gracious mean? We're not going to overdo this. Gracious means being kind. You all know what not kind speech looks like. Don't raise your hand. You know not kind speak. I don't need to explain that. Let's be kind when we speak. Can we covenant? Covenant is an agreement that we're going to make together under God. Can we covenant that this week, the Thanksgiving dinner table happens this week, okay? We're going to need this. Let's be kind when we speak. Can we be kind? Yes. Let's agree. Okay. Let's deal. So that's gracious. I want to do work with attractive. The Apostle Paul. For attractive, some translations say this. Say the speech is seasoned with salt. Now, we're going to wait. I have a funny slide that I'm going to show you. So we're going to wait on that. We'll talk about this for a minute. So attractive is seasoned the right way. When we think of salting, have you ever had a steak that was seasoned perfectly? How amazing is it? What Paul is saying is our speech needs to be seasoned the right way. We can very easily season our speech the wrong way, right? Have you ever had salty speech? You don't think of salty speech as good, do you? If we speak salty, that's probably not church appropriate, right? That kind of speech. So what Paul is saying is, hey, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go into the cupboard and we're going to grab out the Jesus seasoning and we're going we're to dump the Jesus seasoning on our speech, right? We want the, the Christ seasoning, we want to take that. What is the Christ seasoning? It's rooted in God's character. What is God's character? Is God quick to anger? No, God is slow to anger. So our our, our speech should be slow to anger. Is God proud and boastful? No, humble and kind, seasoned the right way. God's speech, good speech, is flavored with Christ's influence. So here's my question. Your speech, salty like a sailor or seasoned with Jesus? We all know the person, maybe we've been the person, who's got the salty like a sailor speech. When our wheel is wobbling, one of the reasons it can wobble is, and there's no church guilt here, I want to be super clear. Anytime we come to something where I say don't, I'm not saying legalistically don't. What we're trying to say is, hey, when I open the Bible, it should not be someone whacking me in the face with the Bible and me crying and feeling bad. If that's been your experience, that's called church hurt, and we're not about that. What we are about... I heard a thank you. You're welcome. But it's not just me. It's this church. I came into this church with that church, this being the posture. Now, here's the deal. When we read this, this is the only book in the world that when I read it, the Holy Spirit meets with me. And literally, we have a conversation. So I read this. I'll read it again. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so you will have the right response for everyone. This is not then, I'm going to take this, and the next time my family member swears at me, I don't say, hey, uh, you need to be seasoned with Jesus. That's not okay. No, it's a personal reflection tool. I can say, wow, Holy Spirit, would you work in my heart? You know, I've been salty like a sailor when I should be seasoned with Jesus. Lord, would you just help me over time let go of some of those things? Not to feel guilty, but so that my walk with Christ can be genuine. Because that's one of the big things. What is people's number one issue with Christians? I ask everybody. I wear Christian shirts and pastor shirts and all sorts of stuff. That means people talk to me about their faith. And so I'll say, hey, since we've had this conversation, what's your hang up with the church? And you know what the number one thing I get is? The people in churches, not this church, but every church, right? The people in churches are more hypocritical than the people outside of churches. That's our challenge, my friends. Good news, though, you've got a silly little thing that you can put on your fridge, salty like a sailor or seasoned with Jesus. When we are having the wobbly wheel and the thing that's missing in our life is thankfulness, we can have thanks speaking. We can have thankful speech. And does it make a difference when we speak in a kind, Christ-centered way? Does that make a difference when people have done that to you? When someone has really seen you and heard you and slowed down and listened and had Christ-flavored, seasoned speech, how much of a difference has that made? Huge. Massive. Reflection questions. I love reflection questions. Number one, does my speech reflect God's character? If I don't know what God's character is, I'll give you a great place to start. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, etc. It's a great place to start. Is my speech loving? Is it joyful? Is it patient? Is my speech transformed with my relationship 
with Jesus. In the times where I'm feeling issues in my life, that wobbly wheel as we call it, maybe the Lord is simply saying, hey, you know, the speech that you choose matters because people look at it and they know you love Jesus. Therefore, they're evaluating Jesus by your speech. So you don't need to feel guilt about that. You don't need to feel condemnation. We know that actually there is no condemnation. Instead, you have a wonderful opportunity from right now. Today is November what? What day in November is this? November 19th. What time is it? 11.07 a.m. At 11.07 a.m. on November 19th, I decided a before and after moment in my life, it's now 11.08, a before and after moment in my life, you know, if my speech has been salty like a sailor, I'm going to work and let the Holy Spirit over time, let it be seasoned with Jesus, and maybe that is simply the change I want to make in my life. So the question is, are you dealing with a wobbly wheel? Thankfulness makes all the difference. We're coming in a time of thanksgiving. It's challenging because for a while we said Thanksgiving was the only holiday we haven't destroyed as a society. Then I walked into the paper store and I saw the aisle with the Thanksgiving cards. And Thanksgiving is probably being consumerized just like every holiday, isn't it? But we don't need to do that. Because Thanksgiving isn't just about this Thursday. It's about thanks praying, making prayer part of my identity. It's about thanks living, seeing that I'm going to grow with Christians and invest with non-believers and understand that, and then my words are going to be not salty like a sailor, but seasoned with Jesus. So we like to give an opportunity for people to respond to messages. We're going to bring the elders forward and the band forward. We're going to sing a wonderful song from the 1970s that I insisted on singing. It's called Give Thanks. And as we're singing Give Thanks, it says Give Thanks with a grumpy heart, right? No, it says give thanks with a grateful heart. If you have a wobbly wheel problem, we don't need to make this weird. We don't need to make it a big deal. Come forward. We just want to pray with you. The people in your church love you. The leaders in your church love you. Your spiritual life matters. Your prayer life matters. Your walk with others matters. Your speech matters. We're not here to shame each other. We're here to encourage, to love each other, and to stir each other to good works. So come forward. Let's pray about that wobbly wheel. Let's have a wonderful Thanksgiving.